Welcome to What is Going Om for new thought from the edge of Om. Each week on Om Time's flagship radio show, veteran broadcaster, author, and media consultant Sandy Sedgbeer conducts thought provoking interviews with inspirational authors, artists, musicians, scientists, speakers, and filmmakers who are working at the point where spirituality and science meet consciousness at the very edge of Om. Here is your host, Sandy Sedgbeer. Hello. There can be few people by now who haven't read the book, seen the movie, or heard of The Way of the Peaceful Warrior, which was based on a true story. Published in 1980, the initial hardback version of the novel attracted minimal attention and then slowly died. The story could have ended there. We would be none the wiser. And millions of people's lives around the world, including that, I imagine, of this week's guest, may well have remained the same. But, as luck or synchronicity would have it, a retired publisher read a copy and wisely decided to give the book the kiss of life. Dan Millman is the author of The Way of the Peaceful Warrior, which became a word-of-mouth international bestseller. A former world champion athlete, university coach, martial arts instructor, college professor, speaker and teacher, Dan Millman joins me now to talk about the spiritual warrior's way, an approach to life which offers us the answers to many of life's most challenging questions. Dan Millman, welcome. Thank you, Sandy. Nice to be here. Dan, just to remind our listeners, the Peaceful Warrior tells the story of a chance meeting with a gas station attendant who becomes a mentor and spiritual teacher to a young gymnast, Dan Millman, who's recovering from a severe motorcycle accident that shattered his leg. Like the character in the book, you were a gymnast, you had a bad injury, you were told it would never completely heal, but of course it did. Was that injury the catalyst for your spiritual quest? I'd have to say yes. It certainly is one of the catalysts. Um, there were others in my life as well, but many people who suffered some dislocation uh, um, in their life, uh, whether financial, uh, personal relationship, uh, or physical injury, um, know how every adversity like that can have hidden gifts of strength and wisdom and perspective. So we don't have to go looking for those type of things. I, I often mention that I don't recommend fractures as a method of personal development. Mm-hmm. But it did shake me up, and I'm pointing up right now, um, and perhaps opened me up to seeing and hearing more than I might have paid attention to. Mm. You've written that Socrates, as you called the gas station attendant, was a compilation of four people who were like mentors to you. You don't say who they were, but I want to know how the idea for the book and merging those four mentors into the character of Socrates first blossomed within you. Well, you know, sometimes a book at the end finds a title and other times the title finds the book. Uh, as a colleague, as an authorial colleague, I know you're an author as well, you can appreciate that. Um, and the term peaceful warrior actually came about organically through my own life experience. I, I used to love that TV show um, called Kung Fu, which was mm. uh, quite a popular show. Uh, yeah. and, and it featured a Shaolin priest who was indeed a, a peaceful type, uh, but well-trained warrior. And... Uh, I wasn't aware till more recently that Gandhi used to call himself a soldier of peace. So the term has been around, but I was creating a course when I was a college professor in um, Aikido and Tai Chi, two martial arts that are more internal arts, dealing with energy and healing and reconciliation, not so aggressive necessarily. And I, I, call, I was going to call the course um, the way of the warrior, but that didn't quite fit. So the idea came up, it popped into my mind, well, I'll call it the way of the peaceful warrior. And it was um, a, a decade later when I began to write the book that, that that phrase, way of the peaceful warrior, just grabbed me. And that became like a hologram that gave me entryway into writing about experiences I'd had with actually two of those mentors, who for now will go unnamed. Um, and, and they inspired uh, insights and perspectives that I, I just wanted to share so much that 
they ended up shaping themselves into a, a book, and that's that's how it came about. You've said that you put your heart and soul into your writing, and I think that shows. I mean, when I read your books, there nothing is wasted. There isn't a wasted word in there, and they appear to be very, very thoughtful and well constructed. Did it take you a long time to write the way of the peaceful warrior? It. It did. Uh, it actually was in uh, fits and starts. It, it wasn't continuous writing, but over a period of seven years, I'd say, uh, the book took shape over many drafts. Uh, and even after the book was sold to uh, my first publisher, the hardback publisher, um, the editor asked some stimulating questions that inspired me to go into a, a frenzy of writing again. And about 20 hours a day for three weeks, I, I hardly slept. And I did the final uh, draft of the book that ended up um, being published. So that's why I had a chan uh, chance to choose my words carefully because draft after draft is, Jack London once said that it takes hard writing to make easy reading. And that's <laughs> what I continue to strive to do, as you know, in, in yeah. all my books. Yeah. So when the hardback fizzled out, I mean, were you crushed, disappointed? Um, how, how did you handle that disappointment? Well, actually, no, I, I had no expectations. Uh, I had no idea what it was like. I didn't even know what a literary agent was. I just sent my manuscript out to a number of publishers, and they all, the New York houses, turned them, them down, sent them back unopened, said, you need a literary agent. So I looked for one, and they agreed to... Uh, put the book out there, um, the, the editor actually thought, because the book blends uh, autobiography with some fictional elements, my editor thought a clever subtitle for the hardback would be a basically true story. And that was clever, but the bookstores were not amused because there was no online selling way back then. And, and the bookstores didn't know where to put it. Is it fiction or nonfiction? It can't be both. So... That's one reason it died. It didn't get into any stores. But the few people who read it, maybe a, a thousand or so, um, we started getting many letters saying, this book changed my life. This book changed my life. I heard it was like an echo. And then my old publisher, who came out of retirement to put the book out in paperback, said, let's title it. Let's use a subtitle, a, a book that changes life. It was provocative, but it wasn't my idea. And um, that's what happened from there. You know, purpose is a theme that runs throughout all of your work. You know, I mean, you can't get away from it and you've written a number of books with purpose in the title. Do you believe now that the work that you've given the world with the Spiritual Warrior's Way was your purpose? Well, it's easy to find one's purpose in retrospect. What's that saying? We can only understand life looking backward, but we have to live it forward. Um, and mm. I, so I can certainly say at this point in time, yes, it was my purpose and destiny, but I had no idea at the time. Um, so I just did what my heart told me to do. I, I, and, and that's why I said I had few expectations about how the book might do. I just knew I had to write it. And I, I did the best to share it and put it out there. And so when it, when it first uh, um, went out of print, I said, well, I guess I had a brief career as a writer. In fact, even after the book came out and started doing well and the word of mouth uh, got uh, some momentum building, I didn't write another book for another at least seven years um, because I felt I'd said what I had to say. But then the influence of uh, new mentors in my life, new experiences, I drove that excitement again, the things I wanted to share in my own words. And that's what uh, was behind the writing that has happened to this day. I've always found it interesting that you published uh, The Life You Were Born to Live, A Guide to Finding Your Life Purpose, mm -hmm. um, because I read The Way of the Spiritual Warrior a long, long time ago. And I have spent most of my adult life studying astrology and looking at numerology and various different um, ways of knowing oneself and when I discovered that you had written the book it didn't at first it was a bit of oh that's interesting you know he writes that and now he's writing this but, you know I want to know more about that what what took you into that area of um, 
the numerology, I guess, you know, some would describe it as. I can answer that in, in two ways. First, um, I wanted to share what was valuable and practical and helpful to people. And so somehow my writing gravitated around uh, elements of life purpose because it's something so central to our lives. Um, and that book, of course, The Life You Were Born to Live, is only one of the books on purpose. There's another book called Living on Purpose. There's another book called The Four Purposes of Life. Um, and so obviously it's been an important part of my teaching uh, as, as well as um, my own expression of the importance of what it means to actually live or focus on the present moment. Um, and also spiritual laws. My work is not based on just my opinion. It, hopefully it's based on universal uh, laws that apply to all our lives. Uh, and that's been a foundation of this way. Now, when you talk about that particular book, um, I had written Way of the Peaceful Warrior. And then uh, 10 years after the initial hardback, I wrote Sacred Journey of the Peaceful Warrior. And both were stories. And people were saying to me, Dan, I, I really loved your two books, but how do you apply this stuff to daily life? And so I ended up writing a book called No Ordinary Moments. And there was too much information in that book to convey it in the, in the context of the story. So it was a nonfiction guidebook, A Peaceful Warrior's Guide to Everyday Life. And, but then there was this new mentor in my life who revealed a system that was more accurate than any I'd ever come across for self-knowledge. Now, I think we all understand the importance of knowing ourselves, because if we really don't know ourselves, then we make the right decision for the wrong person, the one we thought we were. And so this emphasis on self-knowledge was what drove me to share this uh, life purpose system, as I call it. And yes, it is numerology, and I've never really been interested in numerology per se. It didn't make any sense to me how adding up the numbers of your date of birth could give valid, reliable, accurate information about one's life. But this was so accurate, this system that I learned, I said I have to share it, and I could only do so many readings uh, myself. So it was really over a process of uh, about seven, eight years that I went from doing readings to finally teaching professional trainings in the system and then writing the book. So it developed again organically as a consequence and emerged from the, um, the mentors who impacted my life. And that's, that's, you know, people thought I'd gone off on a numerology tangent. It seemed like a left turn, <laughs> but it yeah. was the most effective means I had ever come across. And I studied many systems uh, for accessible self-knowledge, a, a leap in understanding what we're doing here and what we're here to do. That's why I wrote that book and went out on a bit of a limb to do it. You know, I've always believed that the universe, you know, however one regards that word, um, source, whatever, um, has given us everything we need, everything we need. And I think mm -hmm. that the... the spiritual laws in your books the truths the gateways you know all of the things that you talk about which are so simple and so fundamental that one has to recognize them as truths you know they are part of that uh, and so is numerology and so is astrology and so are the other mm -hmm. tools mm -hmm. that exist yeah. for us you know to learn about ourselves well exactly i, I i'm in alignment with that idea that we are given all the resources. We just haven't uncovered them all. Um, a scientist might look at my book and say, well, it may work in practice, but does it work in theory? <laughs> and I can only say that someone else is going to have to come up with a, a, a theory, uh, which we haven't embraced yet, how, how the, the planets and the motions of the planets and our date of birth is, could possibly uh, lend such accurate information. So... I leave that to theorists, but I, the book was a, a major task to put out. Now, you know, I, I'm always a bit self-conscious mentioning uh, a series of my books, but if I'm a tree, these are my branches. They're, they're, yes. they're part of uh, an essential part of my life and how my work developed. And in fact, I'm working on my, probably my last long form work right now. I, the manuscript is sitting uh, in, in front of me um, and it's going to, tell the story of those four mentors and how they influenced my life and work. And it's really the, uh, not just a memoir, which means it has no fiction. 
completely true as I as true as I can make it. But also, it's the story behind the story, and about my lineage, and also. It may inform others' lives about this whole idea of the spiritual quest. So that's what's calling me to work on this final book right now. Mm, yeah, I, am, I'm, I was going to ask about that later. I'm very interested to read that one. Um, you know, the, the life you were born to live, you have in, um, created a 25th anniversary edition. Um, you updated it. What more did you want to add to that one? I mean, you know, numerology, there are clear laws and um, there's a structure to that. What more can you add? Well, there was, you know, when, we, when the book came out in 1994, um, nobody ever thought about what it was going to be like after the year 2000. It was just too much in the future. So there were 37 life paths, but it turns out that certain children born after the year 2000, and now they're 19, almost 20, some of them, um, mm -hmm. they have a different life path, uh, quite, quite radically different. Some of them have a single digit, which may not mean too much to general listeners, but those who understand numerology or those systems, um, that's quite interesting. And so I wanted to include those. So this, the new edition I felt was needed uh, to include all the life paths and some more insights I had more recently about what we call master numbers, what that means um, that hadn't been communicated before, as far as I know. So that's what um, moved me to sit down and, and work on uh, significant revisions in mm. the basic system. Mm. You're listening to What Is Going On. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer. My guest today is former world champion, athlete, university coach, martial arts instructor, professor, speaker, and author Dan Millman. And we're talking about his 17 books, seminars, and courses on the way of the spiritual warrior. We'll be back with more from Dan Millman after the break. The future of Internet Radio is here. Ohm Times Radio. IOM FM. Ascending Hearts is no ordinary dating site, but a spiritual dating site with a purpose, to link you with your soulmate. We engineer the serendipity so you can trust that you will attune with someone that has the same matching vibration as you. Ascending Hearts, the conscious dating site for the spiritually aware. Try Ascending Hearts for free. AscendingHearts.com More than 24 million Americans have an autoimmune disorder, and that number continues to grow. I'm Sharon Saylor, and I'm one of those 24 million. To put that number in perspective, cancer affects about 9 million and heart disease up to 22 million. That's why I've brought together top experts and those thriving regardless of their diagnosis to bring you the latest, most up-to-date information. Join me, Sharon Saylor, Friday night, 7 p.m. Eastern, for the Autoimmune Hour on Life Interrupted Radio to find out how to live your life uninterrupted. I am Fidel Nshombo. I was born in a city called the Bukavu in the Congo. We were a loving family. And then, boom, everything that I had disappeared in a single day. People think that when you are a refugee and they resettle to America, and all your problems are done. They don't understand that that's the beginning of everything. I was not born a refugee. I was made one. It's time we welcome refugee families with open arms. Learn more at EmbraceRefugees.org. Brought to you by the Ad Council. Welcome back. Dan Millman, in 2011, you published The Four Purposes of Life, Finding Meaning and Direction in a Changing World. My goodness, do we need that book. Um, can you tell us very briefly, what are those four purposes? Let me say first that we are hardwired goal seekers. Every human being, when I watch my grandchild crawl, and as an infant, crawl across the floor, they're not just getting some helpful exercise. They want something. They are moving toward some toy or sparkly object. And that's true for any of us. You know, in the Peaceful Warrior movie, the character Dan um, has this revelation, and he talks to Socrates and says, uh, you know, I just realized, Socrates, it's not the destination that makes us happy. It's the journey. And, yeah, there's some truth in that. That's a nice insight to have because most of our lives are the journey. 
Um, and yet, without a destination in mind, without a goal or purpose, there is no journey. We just wander around. So from our point A, we need a point B. And in fact, I would define success and maybe some element of happiness as making regular progress toward a meaningful goal. Those who are working toward a goal, whether it's interpersonal, financial, in a sport or hobby, when they're moving toward a goal, um, they have this absorption in life, this immersion. And that really connects us to life. So that's why I think purpose is so important um, in our lives. And, you know, there are many, many, many purposes, of course. But just as we divide the points on a compass into four primary directions or or the days of the year into four seasons, um, by point, by highlighting four purposes in that particular book, it helps us to make some more sense out of our life. And in brief, the four purposes are first, learning life's lessons. Now, that may not sound like much. We say, well, you know, I know that. That's just uh, we're learning from our life experience. But there's much more to it. Probably won't go into it right at the moment, but it has to do with 12 courses in the School of Life. We're all studying, um, and it has to do with the fact that we can't fail at anything as long as we've learned a lesson. That's the core of our lives. We're here to learn and to evolve. The second purpose um, is what we normally think of a purpose, our career and calling and how those two are different, how calling doesn't need to make money, whereas a, a career does. That's central to the career, even if it has ancillary benefits. So uh, that's, that's uh, important to all of us, how to choose through self-knowledge uh, the most appropriate career and, and to, to reawaken our calling as well, because they can be the same or they can be different. And the third purpose is the one I write about to provide a context in the life you were born to live. In other words, um, our life path, our hidden calling, uh, what we're here to do beneath the theater and behind the, the stage of everyday life. Um, and the fourth purpose may be the most important one of all, which is our purpose in each arising moment. Uh, I, might, so I may not know my cosmic purpose ultimately here. Um, you may not either, but we, you and I both know our purpose right in this moment, having a conversation. So most of us can regain and get grounded again with all this information we're exposed to by, okay, what do I need to do in this moment? And it brings us back to this present and brings us back on purpose. Now, there's a, uh, there's a paradox there, too, because you also write a lot about, you know, being in the present. And so many people are so goal-oriented that they spend most of their time in the future and they completely miss the present. Well, you know, the, the writer Mark Twain once said, I've had many troubles in my life, most of which never happened. <laughs> because most of our trouble, we laugh because we know there's some truth in that. Most of our troubles are projected into the future, something we think we're going to do and it's going to unfold this way and we don't want to talk to that person in this business meeting, whatever it is. Um, or our troubles are in the past. I wish I hadn't. I shouldn't have done that. And I wish I could change it. Um, and, and that's why I bring people back to the idea that there is no such thing Time is, is a convention, but there is no such thing as the past and future except as concepts. All we ever have is this eternal present and this present and this present. Now, it's impossible to grasp the present moment, as any physicist will tell you. Um, how do you grab a nanosecond, you know, a millionth of a second? Um, but what teachers like myself, what we mean by that is to focus on what's in front of us, because what we call the past is a set of neural impressions in our brain we call memory, but it no longer exists except in these impressions we carry. And the future is simply our imagination. There's no such thing as future happiness. We're either happy now or we're not because the future never comes. So the more and more, the more we become realistic and understand that all we have, our moment of power, our moment of, of reality is right now uh, the more realistic and powerful we become, uh, more, we have more presence because we are present. And we start to realize, just as meditators do, uh, noticing the, the waves of thought that pass, the, the river of thought that comes and goes in the passing emotion, like the weather, 
um, we begin to see get a distance from it and realize and get more in touch with what's real and what's right now. And it makes us more effective and more functioning in everyday life. One of the things that I love about uh, certain books that I read is when I read a phrase that is very simple but very truthful and it makes me stop in that moment um, because I have to process the fact that, wow, you know, this is so succinct. It's hit the nail right on the head. And I'm always amazed at how writers, you know, can find those phrases. They're the kind of phrases that I remember somebody once said something about, uh, you know, when you have an epiphany, when things change within you, it's because something has been said that is so true that it makes you stop completely. And in that moment when you stop, there's nothing and in that space, that's the space where change occurs. And um, there are so many throughout your books. And I, I make note of them because, you know, I want to pin them on the wall. Um, but when I was reading about the future and the now, um, and there's no such thing as a future decision, I had to smile because I know people who struggle so much with making decisions um, that they become paralysed and they don't make any decision. And then they bemoan the fact that they couldn't make a decision or they made the wrong decision and they have to change and learn to make a decision but they never do <laughs> and I think well you need to read this and maybe that will help you well thinking about doing something is the same as not doing it yeah. and you might have heard that phrase you know we don't want to we don't want to act without thinking and we don't want to think without acting there is a balance between the two um, so I do have, in, in several of my books, I have a, a method to make more educated, fully educated decisions, bringing in our imaginative and our subconscious uh, as well to make uh, maybe more appropriate decisions, more, more um, holistic decisions. Many people fear making the wrong decision, which leads to paralysis. Yes. Um, and, you know, it's like trying to walk down a city block, let's say in London, and you're trying to decide which foot you're going to use to step off the curb before when you're only halfway down the block. So there's a time we need to make a decision. And we, there's a story I tell in one of my books called The Laws of Spirit, where this ageless woman sage uh, asks me to choose. We come to a fork in the road and she says, please choose which way you're going to go. And I, I look at both directions and I go, finally, I go, you know, I think I'll take that path. And she says, thank you. Now, please make a decision. And I go, oh, maybe you didn't hear me. I said, I'm going this way. She said, yes, now I'm waiting for your choice. And I got a little uh, irritated, and I finally just start walking. And she said, ah, thank you. Because we actually make our decisions not up in our head. We make our decisions when we act. And in fact, E.M. Forster, uh, a, a favorite writer of mine, mm -hmm. he said, how do I know what I think until I see what I do? <laughs> yeah yeah exactly there's there's another phrase that i've you know marked um that i love is the challenge of attending to the present you write about that and you also say that much of the time we humans are bored with the present we don't want to stay here well th there's a more complicated uh, uh response yeah to that idea that it has to do with our RAS, our reticular activating system, which is located near the brain stem. Um, and the RAS has several functions, but it, it tends to habituate. Um, and you, you notice in society today how people seem to want more and more gourmet or fancier, sweet or strong spiced foods. They want more spectacular movies and, and um, this CGI extravaganza, stronger uh, emotional uh, uh, events in movies to, to hold our attention because our attention tends to wander a lot. And we, there are ways to retune the reticular, act, reticular activating system. Meditation can be a help in retuning that to look for refined pleasure. And um, sensory deprivation experiments and practices can help us to start to appreciate the taste, for example, after a fast, not eating for three to five days or seven days, 
or what one wants afterward, we can really enjoy the subtle taste of a carrot, a banana, or whatever, simple foods. Um, and so there are ways to retune the reticular activating system. So we are no longer bored with the present moment. We start to actually notice the world again with the eyes of a child. And children are always noticing things. Um, when, we, when we travel, we, we notice things we wouldn't at home because we kind of wake up in that way. So, but most people, yes, they're, they're, when they say they're bored, it just means they are focusing on the currents of the mind rather than what's around them. And so there are various practices that I, I, I teach occasionally um, to retune that and start to notice and appreciate uh, the, the subtle and to quiet everything down uh, and appreciate simplicity. So I think that's a fundamental life skill. Mm. And of course, you write about that in No Ordinary Moments, and you tell the story too of um, uh, when Dan was uh, practicing and doing some gymnastics, and uh, uh, Socrates was watching him. And then he shrugged off his jacket afterwards or something and asked uh, Socrates what he thought of the performance. And Socrates said, you know, that was great, but but that wasn't the piece where you dropped the jacket on the floor. Because at that point, you were no longer engaged in the moment you were in. You were engaged throughout the performance, but not when you were shrugging your jacket on the floor. And every moment is as important as every other moment. Exactly. In fact, uh, he was reminding me once again that, yes, I was paying strict attention uh, when I was flying off the horizontal bar doing somersaults. But when I pulled off my sweatshirt, um, I wasn't paying attention. And so mm -hmm. he reminded me again, there are no ordinary moments. I was treating one moment as special and another as ordinary. But he added something to that. And this is a key, and this is I'm really sharing a, a fundamental life skill and technique any of your listeners can practice. Um, and that is, he said, Dan, the difference between us is you practice gymnastics. He said, I practice everything. And I didn't understand fully what he meant by that until I really contemplated it. And what he was saying was there's a difference of doing things and practicing them. I mean, we may do the dishes and do our homework and do our work. Uh, at our job, but practicing our work and practicing the dishes. When we practice, we have more a sense of intention to improve, to refine, to expand. And when we do that, it, it brings us into that state of flow, which we all have heard that, that would, it makes us more mindful of what we're doing as we practice. So I'm practicing speaking with you right now. I practice breathing on occasion. I practice walking. I practice doing the dishes. My wife says I still have a ways to go on that account, <laughs> but, but I am working on it. So uh, when we start to practice life, little by little, we become more absorbed in it and attain a different state of awareness. Um, it's a simple technique and idea we can bring into our lives at any time we remember. And Socrates said this many, many, many years ago, and of course now we have the whole mindfulness movement, which is uh, trying to remind us all, you know, to practice, to be attentive to the present moment. And practicing is one way of doing that, the idea, yeah. the concept that I am practicing. Yeah. Um, you know, mindfulness has become a thing, like a meme. Um, mm. But actually, mindfulness simply means paying attention. attention. But it's yeah. also to the present moment without judgment. And yeah, so that that's that's a, a wonderful life skill practice. We're not taught in school, um, although our schoolwork can call us to that, can, can teach us concentration. You know, I, I remind people that awareness is general. Awareness is consciousness, but it manifests in the human being as attention. That's a focusing awareness. Like a, a magnifying glass can focus the sun's power and light. Um, so by attending to things, we can also improve that ability we call it concentration. And like any skill, we can improve on it over time. Yeah. You mentioned the laws of spirit um, in which your character, you know, goes on this journey with the female sage that he meets. And along the way, she um, really presents 12 laws. 
um, you know, she's teaching him the, the spiritual principles, the law of balance, the law of integrity, the law of action, etc. We don't have time to go into all of those now, but is there one among them that you would rate as being more important than any other? The answer clearly is no, um, and yes, because one of those laws may be more important in one moment than another. Um, so there is no particular hierarchy that this, I do start with the law of balance, but the law I might cover right now is the law of action. And the reason I mention the law of action is because it's a foundation element of this approach to living I call the peaceful warrior's way. Um, and that is, we have less conscious control over the emotions that pass through us like the weather and change all the time. And we have less conscious control over uh, the thoughts that appear to in our field of awareness. Thoughts happen to us. We don't say, I think I'm going to think this thought next. Thoughts just appear, random thoughts in our field of awareness. And we can't, we don't have a spam filter in our head. So rather than trying to fix our insides so that we can live well, rather than trying to fix our thoughts and just think positively and just have positive emotions like courage and gratitude and love and so on, um, rather than that, we can bring these qualities into life by focusing on what we do because we have more control over how we act, how we behave, how we move our arms and legs than we do over what emotions we happen to be feeling or thoughts we happen to be thinking in any given moment. So that is the core of what I call the law of action. And that can change our lives. It's a real form of liberation when we can do what needs to be done despite fear, whether, whether or not we're motivated and so on. Um, and in fact, uh, a favorite uh, quote of mine that I, that I often remind people of is, to progress toward our goals, we need to choose one of two following methods. We can find a way to quiet our mind, create empowering beliefs, raise our self-esteem and practice positive self-talk to find our focus and affirm our power to free our emotions and visualize positive outcomes so that we can develop the confidence to generate the courage, to find the determination, to make the commitment to feel sufficiently motivated to do whatever it is we need to do. Ooh, that's pretty complicated. Or the second method, which I recommend, is we can just do it. And it's, <laughs> life is always going to come to that. What will yeah. we do? What needs doing in this moment? Absolutely. You're listening to What Is Going On. I'm Sandy Sedgbeer. My guest today is speaker and prolific author, Dan Millman, whose books, talks, workshops, and courses on living with a peaceful heart and a warrior spirit have influenced millions of people around the world. We'll be back with more from Dan Millman after the break. The cutting edge of conscious radio, Om Times Radio, IOM FM. Being a radio host on IOM FM allows you to build your show on a rich platform with the power of the Internet to fulfill your outreach goals and connect with a very specialized and global online audience, unlimited by time and distance. Om Times Radio will provide you with web relevance, a recognizable conscious brand, and with the standard of excellence that has accompanied every single Om Times endeavor. Host your show with Om Times Radio Network. Hello, I'm Lisa Berry. Join me every Monday at 1 p.m. Eastern Time for Light on Living. A chance to see new, hear different, and feel more as I shine the spotlight on all the ways to lighten the load of life's challenges. Light on Living is your link to that new way you're looking for, that new understanding that will enhance your life, and that positive connection that will support your growth. So join me and you'll gain insight and start to see things in a new way that motivates you. Imagine being fired because of who you love. Imagine being denied medical treatment because of who you marry. Imagine being evicted because of who you are. Millions of Americans don't have to imagine this. They have to live it. Because in 31 states, it's legal to discriminate against LGBT people. 
Get the facts at beyondido.org. Brought to you by the Gill Foundation and the Ad Council. Welcome back. Dan Millman, Paradox, Humor and Change. These are the three eternal truths on which Socrates founded his message and teachings. He talks about how you know, the more we accept paradox, humor and change, the more skillfully we ride the river of reality. Um, we are in unprecedented times of change and many, many people are incredibly fearful. So talk to us about paradox, humor and change. Happy to do so. Um, let's first start with change. You know, we all know on some level that life comes at us in waves of change. When things are going well, we don't want anything to change. Um, and usually don't find any need to change ourselves either. When things are not going well, then we're definitely interested in change. And sometimes we actually uh, take the big step of, of changing ourselves in which we have more control over than changing the world necessarily. Um, but because life comes at us in waves of change, we can't predict or control. We can learn to surf those waves. We can learn like any good martial artist who has multiple attackers coming at them and they learn to step aside and use the force coming at them to throw someone and so on and blend with life um, to make use of it, uh, that energy. We can also learn to do that in everyday life, how to make use of change, how to turn on the dime and be more adaptable and flexible, um, which is one of the big benefits of training in certain martial arts. You kind of learn to embody that. So uh, dealing with change is, is, is a major element of life. And, and when we talk about humor, I'm not talking about as much as it's uh, a nice tension release to laugh, which is why we like romantic comedies, and we like to laugh. It is a form of tension release, uh, and we can all tell jokes, and we appreciate wit and humor, but I'm talking about a different kind of humor, and, and Socrates, the character in my book, um, was talking about cosmic humor. That is fundamentally reaching a point where we don't take ourselves quite so seriously. We don't take our lives so seriously in the sense that we realize life is a kind of game that we play as if it matters. It's important to play it as if it matters, but we have this detachment, this, this distance from it. It's almost like going from the foothills of a mountain where we're down in the weeds, and suddenly we find ourselves on the mountaintop, and we look at the panorama below, and everything looks more beautiful from a distance. So it's being able to step back and look at our lives from a distance, and kind of sigh and go, ah, yes. It's sort of a Taoist idea of accepting the way, the great mm. way, the winding watercourse way, and flowing with that. Uh, that has to do with change, but also that's, that's humor, that cosmic humor, because we need humor, especially today with all the changes happening and the world seems chaotic. It's just in times like this, and it doesn't mean we don't act. Uh, we can respond, I think, more effectively like any good martial arts practitioner, when we're flexible and relaxed and have a sense of distance and perspective. We don't get wrapped up and uptight so much. So that's, um, that's why it's so helpful to understand and embody both the ability to change and flow and also uh, a cosmic sense of humor about it all. But the key for me is paradox. Most people confuse paradox with irony. But paradox really means two uh, opposing ideas that are both true. Um, and if we recall uh, the wonderful book, a Tale of Two Cities by Charles Dickens, it opens with, it was the best of times, it was the worst of times, and followed by a number of other uh, mm -hmm. opposing pairs of statements that convey paradox. And paradox is the key to understanding spiritual life. Uh, or the transcendental world, because our we spend most of our time in the conventional world, as we should, of work and children and, and raising families and doing what we need to do in everyday life. But that's not enough. There, there is more to life than news, weather, and sports and politics. Um, 
we've all had a yearning for the transcendent at times. I believe every human is on a spiritual journey, whether they know it yet or not. Um, but when we understand that there is another dimension, another world, the, the transcendent world, the, the world that calls us to religion or to spiritual practice, to understand the bigger picture of life, what we call spirituality uh, or inspiration, and we start to understand different truths operate. Um, so, for example, does time exist? Conventionally speaking, yes. Transcendentally speaking, time is an illusion. Do we have free will? Conventionally speaking, sure, we make choices all the time. Transcendentally speaking, no, we, we don't choose necessarily what we will choose. That may be shaped by destiny. Uh, and there are other questions about are we separate selves? Sure, conventionally speaking, it's demonstrable. But transcendentally speaking, we're certainly all yes. one. And so on. So that's how paradox can be a key to a much deeper understanding of the foundations of our lives. Mm. I think this seems to be um, a lack of happiness around and you cover happiness um, several times in several of your books the meaning of happiness feeling happy versus acting happy and I was thinking about you know what what you wrote and I it occurred to me that people don't whistle anymore when I was a child you used to see you know jolly chappies wandering down the street hands in the pockets whispering as if they uh, whistling as if they didn't have a care in the world nobody whistles anymore people seem to be very very serious it's very hard for them to find their humor you know see this as a game um everything is becoming so fearful for so many people and that's why there's so many somatic symptoms today of tension yes. and, and breath yep. problems and illnesses. Um, and, you know, a young man came up to me once. Um, I gave a talk at a university, and he, he walked up and said, Dan, I know you do consultations with people sometimes, but you must charge a lot of money. And he said, I'm, you know, what can you tell a poor college student for a dollar? <laughs> so I, I smiled at him, and I told him six words that could change his life, a lifetime practice. Which And those six words were here and now, breathe and relax. And if we just practice that a little bit each day, just remember, where am I? I'm, you know, here. What time is it now? And breathe. Take a deep breath. No matter what the circumstance, we can always take a deep breath. And we can relax. We can shake loose. You see, people are worried about stress. And stress is an idea. It's not a thing. Stress is just a word we have, a concept, when we resist something we don't like. Um, people can get stressed at happy occasions, weddings, um, family gatherings. It's not just bad things that cause stress. And, you know, I, I joke with people sometimes, and I say, I can tell you exactly how to feel no more stress in your life. And they go, oh, well, what is that? And I go, well, just don't care about anything. But we do care about things. That's not realistic advice because we're engaged with life. We do care. Um, so stress is part of our lives. It's a natural thing. However, however, I can offer more helpful advice in the sense that stress when we're relaxed is very different from stress when we're tense. So while we're going through a stressful situation, it's especially important to shake loose and take a deep breath. And that can change our relationship to stress because it's not the stress that hurts us. It's the tension associated with it. And we, can, we have a control over that. Not, we don't have control over stress. We do have control over whether we're tense or relaxed. So that's just a word to the wise. Hmm. I want to talk in um, our last minutes about parenting. You mentioned earlier when we were talking about um, your book on numerology, the, the children that have been born since the millennium. And they seem to have, their lives are much more stressful than I remember, you know, my children's lives were growing up. Apart from the fact that we live in a digital age, there's a lot of stress on them, a lot of pressure. And we're seeing an 
you know, a horrible rise in young people committing suicide, which is really sad. You've written two books for children, Quest for the Crystal Castle, A Peaceful Warrior's children's book, which is for four to eight-year-olds, and Secrets of the Peaceful Warrior, which um, is for the nine to ten-year-olds. Let's talk a little bit about the Peaceful Warrior and what people, parents especially, can learn from that to help their children. Well, having raised, um, uh, I have three daughters and, and um, they, I'm proud of all of them. And also we have grandchildren, so I'm, it's a second helping. So um, <laughs> my publisher said, can you write a Peaceful Warrior book for children, Dan? And I sat back and I tried to model it after the first book, but I wanted to inculcate some fundamental values that children could relate to that wasn't preachy. And so I ended up writing these two children books. But to me, the way we approach, um, you know, parents who ask me, um, should I teach my children, my my three-year-old to meditate? And I I often really don't recommend that because children are like puppies. Their needs are simple. They need to be hugged. They need attention sometimes to show they're valuable and worthwhile. And they need to eat when they're hungry and get enough rest. Um, And then we just get out of their way. So I think we don't need to to overexert to help children, let them play and discover life and have some alone time and, and away from screens and that sort of thing. Um, so that's what we practice with our children and, and grandchildren. Um, and if I can return for a moment to the idea of happiness, I, I didn't really respond to your question. Um, I would say in terms of happiness, um, I don't see it as a good feeling. Now, certainly it's nicer to feel happy than the alternative. Um, but feelings are not really under our control. And if we were happy all the time, we wouldn't even know it. Uh, it's, it's been said the measure of our sorrows is also the measure of our joys. So when we have a cold, we really appreciate good health. When we're feeling unhappy, we appreciate the sense of happiness, fulfillment, satisfaction. So to me, happiness is a practice. And people ask me, well, what do you mean a practice? How can you practice it? Well, I tell people, I do not recommend that you feel happy or peaceful, or loving, or grateful, or kind, or courageous, or confident. I recommend you practice behaving that way. And people go, well, isn't that kind of inauthentic, behaving that way if you don't feel it? And I ask, well, what if you're feeling afraid, but you behave with courage? Is that inauthentic, or is that a virtue? And just as we can behave with courage when we're feeling afraid, we can behave with kindness when we're feeling irritated, We can behave with gratitude and say thank you, whether or not we happen to be feeling grateful in the moment. And we can practice happiness by behaving the way we do when we're feeling happy. We're more expansive, we're more present, uh, we're kinder. So happiness can be a radiant practice. And that's the practice I do in everyday life. I practice all these things, whether or not, whatever feelings happen to be passing through me. This is a radical teaching, and you don't hear it very much. So I wanted to at least I, I, um, share that with your, your uh, listeners. I'm glad you did, because, you know, I think that also is extremely relevant for parents. I was going to ask you if you, you know, had any suggestions on advice that parents might give to their children. But actually, you've already answered that for me because we don't have to give them advice. They don't want to hear our advice. But if we model happiness and show them how they can also act happy at those moments in their lives that are are challenging for them, well, I think we're giving them, you know, uh, a, a great gift just right there. Well, I would agree with you so much, Sandy. You know, um, writer James Baldwin once said, children have never been very good at listening to what their parents tell them, but they never fail to imitate them. Yes. And (laughs) to me, now, it doesn't mean we have to be perfect. Nobody is. We make mistakes, but we need to own up to it. That can be something a parent can do. I'm sorry. I I, I ask your forgiveness. I I apologize because I messed up. You know, I was irritable and tired and I yelled at you. That sort of thing. We're open. Children model that. They learn from, you know, Albert Schweitzer once once said, in influencing other people, example is not the main thing. It's the only thing. Yeah. Yeah. 
And, and that's so true. That's so true. I mean, I'm a grandparent too, and I watch sometimes my daughter um, talking to her children. And I have to, you know, I squirm because that was me. That was me. And, you know, I, I know better now. I didn't know better then. But there she is, modeling the same behavior. <laughs> Can't get away paradox, from it. Too. I, I totally, yes. Uh, you know, by the time we are really good parents, they call us grandparents. And at that, by <laughs> yeah. that time, our, our children don't want to listen to our grandparent advice because <laughs> they have their own children to raise. Yeah. So what yeah. we learn, somehow generation to generation, we're learning. And even today in the chaos of politics in the world today and trends and changes, um, we are learning. This, these are teachable moments. Uh, and I, I think we will come out stronger uh, uh, on the on the other end of it, we may, it may not show right away, but I, I believe we are evolving. Life is better today than it was 100 or 200 or more years ago. Uh, there are fewer wars today, fewer people being killed, are uh, fewer uh, impoverished people on the planet compared to 100 years ago, um, and, and so on. So I, I'm sort of a uh, ultimately I, I'm an optimist, but even though I'm I'm not always in the short term. Well, I'm glad you ended with that, Dan, because I think it's really important for us to remember that, especially, you know, in such uh, difficult times. Dan Millman, thank you so much for joining us today. Oh, my pleasure. 17 books and all worth reading. If you're new to Dan Millman's work or have read only one or two, each one of those 17 has many insights to offer. You can go to peacefulwarrior.com check out the books and also check out the app the special calculator and app that will allow you to discover your life purpose i'm sandy sedgbeer thanks for joining me today i'll be back at the same time next week